the God of eternity, that means he stands above time all at the same time. And he's more powerful than you realize. He's wiser than you think. He has more love than you can possibly imagine. His holiness is purer than you could ever approach on your own. He is God. He is. And he, out of his goodness and grace, made the universe and he made planet Earth. He's the creator, the only one. He's the only God and all others are made by people. I say all other gods are made by people. He created man on this planet in his image and he made man with personality. And some of your kids have more personality than other kids. You're like, God, why'd you do this? But that's what he did. He made man with personality. He made man to be sovereign over earth. You realize that? He made man for relationships. He made man with creative abilities and the potential to make something out of God's very good creation. That's how God made man as an image bearer. God is a good God. He's the only God. And he has been only good to humanity since the beginning. So good to humanity that he even gave humanity the autonomy to make his own choices. He gave that to mankind. Man could rule this earth God's way according to his wisdom. Or man could rule this earth his own way according to his own wisdom. The first man chose the creation of God over the creator. And mankind has been doing that ever since. And that's really what it comes down to for you. Either you're still choosing the creation and looking to the creation to meet every need you have. Or you're looking to your creator. The first man was created and placed in a garden that was paradise. And when he chose to rebel against God, he lost paradise. And mankind has been pursuing paradise his own way ever since. How has that pursuit been going? God never stopped his pursuit. Meaning, God never stopped loving humanity. He never stopped loving mankind. Also meaning, he never stopped hating what was evil for mankind. You see, you cannot love someone and not hate what is evil for them, what is bad for them. And God is holy and he's pure and he's good. And so he both loves you the way you are and how you are, but he loves you so much that he hates what's evil for you. It's like a parent loving his children. He loves his child so much that he hates what is bad for them. And that's our God. But mankind began to tear himself apart. And we have seen that God stepped in on more than one occasion and brought justice and judgment on earth to purge the world of evil men who were destroying themselves. God never stopped desiring to bless mankind as he blessed the first humans at the beginning. In fact, by Genesis chapter 12, the Bible story focused on God's plan to bless all of mankind through one man and his descendants. What do you think the man's name is, was? Abraham. Look at that. I've got you in Matthew 1 for a reason. Look at that first verse in Matthew 1. It says, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of who? Abraham. Or whom? Abraham. The rest of the story is all about Abraham's descendants. Okay? So the Old Testament is all about Abraham's descendants through whom God planned on blessing the nations. So God preached the gospel ahead of time to Abraham, according to Paul in Galatians chapter 3, verse 8, telling him that, In thee, Abraham, shall all nations be blessed. And God made a covenant with Abraham and his offspring, and he promised Abraham. Remember, just think back with me. He promised Abraham that he would give Abraham and his offspring a land that would be theirs forever. He promised that he would multiply Abraham's descendants so they could not be numbered and kings and nations would come from them. He promised that he would be a God to Abraham and his descendants forever. Forever is what he said. And God was faithful to that covenant through all the ups and downs of Abraham's descendants from Matthew chapter 1 verse 2. See it? Abraham begat Isaac. That happened. That's found in Genesis 21. Okay? I'm connecting two things here. For, I'm connecting this genealogy and what it would have meant for the first century Israel reader and what we have been looking at in the Old Testament. Are, are you with me? 
All right? You say, maybe we should have done this before we ever began, Matthew. Yeah, I was a new pastor. Okay? And come back in 20 years and it might get better. I don't know. We pray so. We're working at it. But see, God was faithful to his covenant through all the ups and downs of Abraham's descendants from Matthew 1 verse 2 all the way to Matthew 1 verse 6 where Jesse begat David the king, which is in 1 Samuel. From Genesis to 1 Samuel, the people of Israel, the descendants of Abraham, had many ups and downs. Who were here for Pastor Foster's message about we have many ups and downs, but mostly down. And we want to look to the Lord so we, we level out with God. Well, the people of God had many ups and downs, mostly downs, and yet God was faithful to his promises to them. Now, just because God was faithful did not mean God let them off the hook either. Faithful parents don't let their kids off the hook. You know what it's called? Consistency. Oh, Lord help me. See, God is a responsible God. And he expects mankind at large and his people specifically to be responsible. His mightiest mouthpiece, Moses, back in the early days of the budding nation of Israel, preached that God was offering Israel a blessing or a curse. See, God was committed to them and he gave them his law so they could prove by obedience they were committed to him. If they would hold on to God with all their heart and obey his commandments, they would be blessed as his people in the promised land. And in being blessed, they would bless all the nations. And we see that in part being fulfilled in the glory days of David and Solomon. However, if they refused to hang on to God and they followed the trends of humanity at large who chose to worship what man created rather than the creator, if they rejected his commandments, they would be terribly cursed. God's people Israel. They would be removed from the land he promised them, dragged into captivity by their enemies in order to serve the man-made gods that they loved. So the history of the Old Testament from the time of the judges to the times of David the king on down through the royal descendants of David through Matthew chapter 1 verse 11. See how it ends there about the time they were carried away to Babylon? Okay. This Old Testament history, it plays out as a history of repeat offenders against God and his faithful covenant. Are you a repeat offender against your faithful God? See, the nation of Israel eventually splitting in half into two kingdoms because of their sin, north and south, Israel and Judah found itself on a downhill slide into a destruction. And God sent his people into captivity like he said he would because of their sins. God sent his enemies and the enemies of his people, the nations of this world who hated God and worshipped man-made gods, he sent them against his people to bring his people into captivity. And God's people, Israel, had the opportunity to gain paradise as the covenant people of God. A king, they could be a kingdom of priests if they would be faithful to God. But the problem was their sinful hearts. The problem was a problem of the heart. And what they loved and who they loved and who they did not love. And they lost the kingdom that God gave them freely. And they became captives to other kingdoms. And even when God in his mercy and his faithfulness to his covenant with them, even when he brought them back to the land he had promised them, as we've seen the past month or so, they'd never really gained the kingdom back. From the time of Zerubbabel, mentioned in verse 12, or Zerubbabel, or however his name is pronounced, help yourself. From that time, mentioned in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 12, to the time in which Jesus Christ was born, the people of Israel were under oppressors. They were oppressed by the Babylonians. They were oppressed by the Medes and Persians. They were oppressed by the Greeks. They were oppressed by the Romans. Now, well before all this oppression happened, God anticipated it would happen. And he told Daniel, remember Daniel? All those weird dreams he had were about this group of oppressors here. From the Babylonians to the Medes and Persians to the Greeks to the Romans. They oppressed the people of God. And honestly, since the glory days of David and Solomon, even to this day, Israel has never been a glorious kingdom. They have not overcome their enemies. Are they dominant in the world? 
to this day, they're still oppressed by their enemies, still have many nations that hate them. And they probably still wonder, as likely as they were wondering, in the days of Jesus, who was their Messiah? Is their Messiah? They probably still wonder, when will the kingdom of God come? When will our king come? When will he defeat our enemies? When will he fulfill God's promise to us? When will he restore the land? When will he bless the nations through us? When will it happen? When will our Messiah arrive? They were not wrong to hope for the kingdom of God. They were not wrong to anticipate the Messiah's coming. They were not wrong to look for the son of David, the anointed one, the chosen one. The offspring of King David who would be born in Israel to bring light to the darkness and break the bondage of the oppressor and rule the kingdom of the Lord that would never end. They were not wrong to long for the restoration of Mount Zion. To long for the judgment of God upon their enemies and the glorious eternal worship of God in Jerusalem. They were not wrong to desire for God to, as he promised, to shake the heavens and the earth and fill his temple with glory and make the cities and land of Israel to prosper and grow and, and create a new heaven and new earth. They weren't wrong to long, any, to long for any of that. They were not wrong to want any of that. See, all of those prophets on your timeline that God had sent them. Are you ready? Look at it. From Joel, to Amos, to Hosea, to Isaiah, we're going left and right here, to Micah, to Zephaniah, to Habakkuk, to Jeremiah, to Ezekiel and Daniel, to Zechariah, to Haggai, to Malachi, God sent those men to speak words of truth. And he sent those men in the Old Testament to warn his people of impending judgment if they would not turn to him. To warn them of judgment because of their sins. And yet at the same time he warned them of judgment. God sent those men to prophesy good things. Why? Because his covenant with them would never fail. God never casts off his elect people. And when I say elect people, in this sense, I mean the Jews. As Paul wrote in Romans 11, God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. Verse 29 of Romans 11, For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. God will keep his promises to his people Israel. He will do that. All of that was and is true. The problem was and is this. The people of Israel overlooked And still overlook their need for a Christ who would save them from their sin. Isn't that like us? We want our problems to be solved and our oppressors to be removed. But we don't want God to deal with our sin. Why did the people go into captivity in the Old Testament? They sinned against God. They did not love him. Even after God restored them to the land, we looked at the shape they were in last week when God sent Malachi in the scene. They were corrupt. They were not faithful to God. They were non-committal to the God committed to them. And they needed to, God to purge their sins. Look at Matthew chapter 1 and verse 16. So we're introduced here to Jesus who is called Christ. The genealogy, Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. When he was born of a virgin, he was named Jesus, Yeshua, which means the Lord, Yeshua, is salvation. And why would he be called Yeshua? Why would he be called Jesus? Because he would save his people from the Romans, from their sins, verse 21. See, as much as the prophets of the Old Testament prophesied of the king to be born and to rule the kingdom, and as much as God promised to deal with their enemies, his people overlooked the fact that the servant of the Lord would first suffer for their sins. Isaiah 53. That's what God said in the Old Testament. They overlooked the fact that their king would not come marching in on a war horse. Come on, Romans, give us the best you got. We're going to get you. He came riding in a donkey to symbolize peace, Zechariah 9 was prophesied. They overlooked the fact that one day they would look at him whom they pierced and they would mourn over him 
As over, the, uh, as over someone's only begotten son, Zechariah chapter 12. In other words, the people of Israel in the days of Jesus overlooked the fact that their Messiah would first come to suffer for their sins. And they would play a part in his suffering. And only when they were made right with God through the suffering of their Christ, that's when they would be given new hearts, see, with the ability to obey God. And only then, then and only then, could they enjoy all the promises God gave to them and made to them about that land and that kingdom. And listen, one day, that day will literally come. It will come. If we're going to take the Bible for what it says, and God for the truth-telling God he is, that day will literally come. But we need to transition here. The Old Testament ended with the prophecy of Malachi. Go back a page. You're really close. There were 400 years of silence that happened between Malachi and Matthew. God was silent toward his people for 400 years. And before he stopped talking, he promised that he would send a messenger like Elijah. Remember Elijah? Elijah? In the Old Testament, he would send a messenger like Elijah, he said in chapter 4, to prepare the way uh, before him. And after that messenger did his work, the Lord himself would suddenly come to his temple. Go back to chapter 3 and verse 1. God said this about, uh, let's see, near the bottom of the verse. He said, behold, he's talking about the Lord that would suddenly come to his temple. He said, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. So I'm going to send a messenger who's going to come in the power who's going to be like Elijah. And that when he comes to prepare the way of the Lord, the Lord is going to come suddenly to his temple. Verse 2. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he's like refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. See, when the Lord would come, he would come to purify his people and to purge them of iniquity. And that was, that was Malachi. You have 400 years Of radio silence. And 400 years later, the messenger came. Out in the desert. God sent John the Baptist, who was miraculously born of two aged, righteous Israelites. And God sent him to preach, repent to God's people. Turn around. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And in so preaching and baptizing those who repented... John prepared the way of the Lord until one day he's at the river there and he looked up and he beheld Jesus walking toward him and he pointed two of his disciples to Jesus and he said, Behold, what does behold mean? Look, look, the Lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world. And then Jesus comes to John. He's like, I want you to baptize me. He's like, you want me to what? What? I should be baptized of you. Not the other way around. And Jesus said, let it be. Thus it it behooves us to fulfill all righteousness. And so John the Baptist baptized, dunked Jesus underwater. And as he comes up, the heavens were opened up above them. John saw the Spirit of God coming down on Jesus like a dove. And there was a voice that spoke from heaven. After 400 years of silence, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And Jesus Christ began his short ministry on earth just like God promised. And though in times past, the writer of Hebrews would say in Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 and 2, though in times past God had spoken to his people by the prophets, he was now speaking to the people by his own son. And Jesus began talking He began preaching, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he taught the people with authority what citizens of the kingdom of heaven look like and how they live. And unfortunately, few of the people of Israel actually repented and believed Jesus was their Christ. Have you ever heard, well, if God would just come to earth, then I would believe. Well, God came to earth. And many of the people in that day didn't believe. Why? Their heart. 
And Jesus anticipated his people would reject him. He told his disciples what God had been saying all along throughout the Old Testament, that he would be betrayed, he would be forsaken, he would be judged and condemned to death by his own people and sentenced to suffer a cruel death, and yet he knew he would rise again. The plan of God in relation to his coming kingdom would not be stopped, even if his people were not ready for him. You see, God knew this would happen. And he orchestrated the events of Jesus' life and death to such minute detail to prove to all the world that Jesus' sacrifice for the sins of the world was planned before the world began. God raised his son from the dead and God's son will return to fulfill all God had promised to his people. And that's what we're going to study in Matthew 24. And I want to make this personal to you. Don't you think you can trust the God who created everything and works everything out according to his good plan? You see, if, if you have repented and believed the gospel of Christ, you are in Christ Jesus. And when God sent Jesus to earth to fulfill his plan, all that God had planned for him happened. And he suffered and he died and he rose again and he sits at God's right hand. And you, if you know Christ, you are in Christ. So as you walk with Jesus and follow Jesus, you can rest assured, I am secure in Christ. And that can motivate you to live the life you ought to live. Don't you think you can trust him if he fulfilled his good plan in Jesus and you have repented and believed and you are in Jesus that he's going to fulfill his good plan to you. That if he has been so faithful to his people, even in spite of their ridiculous disobedience, he will be faithful to you, dear Christian, dear child of God, and he will not cast you away. Don't you think you can believe the God who is faithful and good and just? We were talking about this this morning in our disciple fellowship. We often have a hard time trusting each other, don't we? And we take that perspective of God or of man and we apply it to God when he is nothing but faithful and good and just. Don't you agree that you need your sins forgiven and your heart changed? Or do we need to ask your spouse about that? Or your children? Don't you want his kingdom of righteousness to come and fill the earth? <laughs> don't you recognize that we don't deserve to be a part of that kingdom, but Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures? And he was buried and he rose again according to the scriptures on the third day and he was seen alive again and again and again and again and he ascended back up to the heavens to sit at God's right hand until he comes back again and the my bible says that he offers you the complete forgiveness of your sins he suffered in your place. He died for you. He will clean your heart. He will give you a new one. He will make you right with God. And he will give you God's Holy Spirit. And if you have believed this message, that's what you have. And you have the hope of his coming kingdom. And you can live each day for the eternal kingdom of God that is coming when he comes back. So now you know the rest of the story. And it's true. It's the real deal. And based on what you know about it, and based on what you know about Jesus, how will you let Jesus rewrite the rest of your story? Will you let him pick up the pen in your life? Or are you going to hang on to this pen? You see in the timeline, my handwriting's terrible. And that's you and me when we try to write our own story. Unless we put that pen in the hands of him who's been writing the story of all the universe since before the world began. Will you trust him to rewrite your story?